Hi, I'm Tamsin Jones, and it's my very great pleasure to have Carson Kuman as my guest. Welcome, Carson. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay, so um, I know that you're the composer in residence at Harvard University, um, but beyond that, I don't know very much about you. So I wondered if you'd mind telling me a little bit more about yourself, please. Sure, sure. Yes, my primary affiliation, as I am the composer in residence for Memorial Church at Harvard University, um, which is also where I did my uh, the first part of my college education. I grew up in the western part of New York State in the USA. Um, and went to college um, at Harvard in music. Then I went to graduate school at Carnegie Mellon University, and then I returned uh, to the staff at Harvard, where I've uh, remained really ever since, basically as a as a home base. Um, so that's the short shortest version of the the beginning. Okay, fantastic. And I understand that you're a student of Judith Weir, among other people. Can you tell me? <clears> I was. That? I, I studied with Judith for my uh, last year in college. She was uh, she was the uh, visiting professor at Harvard uh, for my final year. I had studied with uh, Bernard Rands, um, composer for the first three years, and then I studied with Judith for my last year. So that fantastic. Was that. Yeah. And um, what are your abiding memories of that experience of of studying composition in the academic setting, and what impression did it make on you? Uh, I. I I think it was it was it was generally a positive experience. I think you know it's 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 valuable to have, particularly a very formative set of years, to have the experience of other people's reaction to your work and things. I I had written a fair amount of music by that point already, um, and uh, and and so I I I felt comfortable with certain things, but the value of the perspective in those years can help sort of push you into thinking about doing what you're doing in the best way you can sort of being the best version of yourself you can be artistically um which is certainly something i try and do with students now um and and uh i think in the best part of that composition teaching that's that's sort of what i got what i got out of that that experience uh, the year with judith was particularly um particularly good she she really engaged with my work sort of as it was and sort of really got into it helped me Help me make it better. She realized that I wrote a lot of music, and so she leapt into sort of engaging with a ton of it herself, listening to many, many pieces, rather than just sort of you know many times in lessons you sort of work on one piece very, very slowly over a long period of time, mm. and that wouldn't have been a particularly effective way to deal with my output as a composer. And right, she, so she realized that and and sort of dealt with that accordingly. So. That sounds like a very positive experience. So <laughs> it seems to me that um, your teachers were not trying to um, remodel you in their form, but rather they were letting you yeah. be yourself, which is, which is, I think, the best approach to teaching. Mm -hmm. And um, also, um, it seems to me that when you come across a new idea or a change of thinking, rather than sort of trying to perfect it in a single composition you prefer simply to get on and write new music and just to keep the thing flowing would that I be think, a fair characterization I, I think in general i think for me it for me at least early, early on it was clear the way to get better at writing music was to write a lot of it um <clears throat> and so that doesn't mean that there wasn't revision and editing and things there definitely was but it but it it did it didn't mean the tendency was more to to work on a piece basically get it done and then sort of move on to another move on to another work rather than sort of revisiting the same piece endlessly for a year brilliant brilliant i, I think particularly in in early years there's particularly in early years as a composer there's real value in pushing people to do a lot of different things because you sort of you know at a certain point you don't necessarily know what you mm. want to do even or exactly how to do it you haven't sort of felt your comfort in those areas and if you if you don't explore pretty widely you're missing that opportunity to to do that right okay now taking you further back in time i'd like to ask how did you get interested in music what got you started <clears throat> i was, composing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was born, composing born into music. a family that um there was only one professional musician in the family my my father's mother, my maternal, uh, paternal grandmother. Um, but everyone took music sort of seriously. And um, a number of family members had had various sort of avocational things with music. So there was never, <clears throat> there was never any sense that music was a, 
an unusual thing to do. It was, you know, one possibility among many kinds of work that one could do. Um, and so I was, I was given piano lessons from a fairly early age. Um, and that sort of went along. And, and at a certain point, I started to just on my own get interested in writing music. Um, and then a, a little after that, also changing my primary instrument to the to the organ, the pipe organ. Um, and at a certain point, that just sort of solidified as what it seemed like the future for me was going to be. Right, and, so I see. <laughs> and um you you you're obviously um a, a, a very well known famous organist and pianist, but do you play any other instruments? Not no, no. I, I did study the cello for a few years, oh. many years ago in, in school, which which was a good experience. I was glad to I'm glad to have I'm glad to have had those few years of experience doing something that wasn't a keyboard instrument. Um so that's useful information, you know, as a composer, useful perspective. Mm. Um, but but certainly I was I was not a performer of any skill on that and I, and since then I haven't I I definitely haven't it's it's mostly a matter of it would be interesting to pursue playing other instruments or things but I you know the it part of being a professional musician is knowing just how much time it takes to be good at those things and and devote that and there there simply there simply isn't time to learn the clarinet or something even if I suddenly had a burning desire to do it it would there, it just wouldn't really be possible so. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I took up playing the organ myself um, last year, and I've been playing for about 10 or 11 months now, and I'm just getting to the point where I'm sort of confident enough to play for church services and um, to put just modest videos onto YouTube. But it, it was, a, I mean, I've been very fortunate in having access to a good instrument and being able to practice more or less every day for for several hours but even so i mean especially at my advanced age it's, it's a really daunting learning curve and the thing about certain musical instruments in particular is that um it takes so long just to get to the point where you can make even a bearable sound okay yeah. so i'm totally totally uh, relate to that <laughs> my my own background as a performer was in singing um, mm. but then I had some issues with my voice and I I kind of wanted to do something different. Um, mm -hmm. I was involved for a long time with the English um, choral tradition and and when my career as a composer started to to gain some traction, um, then I, I gradually lost interest in singing in choirs and wanted to focus more time on the creative and and then mm -hmm. You know, playing the organ came along as well, so that's that's another thing. But again, yeah, time. So, moving on to your compositions, um, I greatly enjoy listening to your music because it has this great ability to be, on the one hand, quite spiky and um, challenging, but at the same time, um, it's got a, a warmth and an openness about it. It's a kind of welcoming modernism, I like to describe it. It's, it's very, very appealing. And um, to give just one example, your carol, Adam Lay Bounden, and mm -hmm. that has a great deal of energy that really builds up through the piece and then, and then explodes. But the thing is, that's not all. Your style <laughs> has many dimensions to it. So, for for instance, um, your fantasy variations in the flute concerto, again, that has um, some really beautiful gentle textures, particularly there's the moment there where the violins are playing sul ponticello with sustained notes and mm. everything seems to stand still for a moment. That's absolutely gorgeous. And then I was recently very, very honoured that you composed a Ricicare al Monaco mm. for me. And it seemed to me that um you had looked into my my music because there was this element of um of strict canon fugal procedures um the emphasis on um, perfect intervals I, I felt that really spoke to me so thank you ever so much for writing that that was a really nice surprise to get that um and again other pieces that um I've particularly enjoyed hearing of the um, a path through the rainfall mm. fantastic piece just love the way that the right hand has this kind of reiterated raindrop pattern 
and then gradually the music becomes a little bit warmer, a little bit thicker in the texture. The, the themes start to become more apparent as though there is a path coming out. And then there's, the, I mean, there's just such a wealth of music. Um, so that's my impression of it. But um, I'd like to know, how would you describe your aesthetic? What are you doing in your music? Yeah, I, 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 I like to try and keep the expressive possibilities as widely open as I can um, across across different pieces, across the catalog as a whole, and to, to a degree, even within a specific piece. I'm, um, I'm interested in, in the having the widest palette I can to, to yeah. use in service of the goals of any particular piece. Um, and right. so that does mean that does mean some pieces are, are more traditionally consonant than others, and, and some are a mix of things. And so it's a sort of wide continuum. And that depends, that depends on a huge variety of factors. Some of it is what the piece is trying to be. Some of it is the circumstance for which the piece is written or the the particular forces involved. Um, and and working across genres and across different things, my hope is that I, by keeping all these options open, I have different possibilities to express what I want a particular piece to do. Um, and so the result is, um, is a fairly wide variety of things, I think. Um, but that's that's just sort of always been the the direction that's interested me. I'm 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 not sort of a specialist in that respect as a composer. I don't I don't do mostly choral music or mostly organ music or per se. Even though like those are two genres I have done many things in. But I don't I don't really consider myself primarily a composer in any one genre. What interests me is the the variety the variety of genres and the things that are that are possible across them. And it also, that also, at least in my case, it allows me to sort of make sure that I can write a piece for a particular ensemble or scoring or circumstance that fits what that sort of thing can do well. Um, and so my my choral music in general, for example, is not nearly as um, pushing at the edges as, as some of the other genres are. And I, for me, that's simply a matter because it's, that's what choir, choirs do best that way. I've sat through endless rehearsals of pieces that are far too difficult, you know, and it's sort of like when I have ideas that feel like they would go in that direction, I can use them in other genres as well. A string quartet can play music that a choir would have an enormous time singing and the strings can sit down and sight read it, you know, so, and I feel, I felt if I, if I, like some of, some of my colleagues who, who do excellent work, like mostly within the single genre, and sometimes they have a very wide variety within that genre because that's the only thing they work at. So they might have very, very hard choral pieces and very easy ones or some continuum. And I, I don't push those envelopes in quite that same way within the genre, um, partially just because I know what it's like to rehearse difficult music and, and choirs and things and what a frustration that is uh, to people. Um, so I try and I try and keep keep it fairly singable. Yeah, because I mean, I had a lot of my formative musical experiences in the 1990s, and this was right at the end of the um, wave of modernism in British music, at any rate, and a lot of choral music that was being produced up until that point was just really hard to sing, and and not very rewarding to sing either. So even if you got the notes right, you'd be well on edge doing it. And then the results would not be especially satisfying. I think there's, a, I mean, I was talking to Sarah MacDonald in, in another episode of Composers in Conversation, and the idea of appropriateness was something that she emphasised. And I think actually this is one of the keys to good orchestration, good composition in general, is writing for the forces in question, because if the performers feel comfortable, then they can really do so much more with the music than if you write music that kind of works against the natural mechanics yeah. of the instrument, the natural mechanics of the voice and so on. Um, so this takes me on to the next talking point, which is... Um, Essentially, in your opinion, what is it that you think that a contemporary classical a contemporary classical composer should be trying to do? Are we composing art for art's sake, or are we making some kind of comment on society? Are we there to advance human knowledge, or is there some other purpose, perhaps? 
I'm I'm not sure there's any universal answer to that. I think I think different people have different goals in their in their work, either overall or even on a piece by piece basis at times. Um, in the same for me personally, in the same way that the expressive dimensions of my music are fairly varied, the the that aspect of how I think about pieces admittedly varies as well. There are some pieces are really written um, just to explore certain musical ideas in a fairly pure way in one sense. Um, but there are other pieces which the thinking behind them or the inspiration behind them definitely comes from something that something external or something social. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I personally have an overarching sort of philosophy that I'm trying to accomplish across all, all the music per se. And I don't think I would ever try and say what I think everyone else should be doing. You know, I, I think the role composition plays in the lives of different people, different artists is, is varied. Um, and people are, people are sort of very varying degrees of seriousness about to the extent they see themselves as a composer in the context of their larger musical life. Um, you know, for some people, it's a very practical act aspect of what they're doing most of what they write comes because they need it for for themselves or one way or another this is you know this is especially true of, of church musicians for a large part very often that's why people write what they need they need a particular setting of a text for their choir or they need a setting in three parts instead of four parts because those are the musicians they have or, um so i i don't think it's a i don't think it's a monolith and i don't i i certainly wouldn't put any Try and put any pressure on on someone to say that you know you should be working in a certain way or you should have a certain goals um some people are highly motivated by political concerns in their music or by other things and so other people are motivated into entirely by music or entirely by writing music for their friends because they like they just like playing it together or you know so i so i think it's i think it's as varied as people are varied in general so it's going to going to be different depending on who you speak to Speaking for myself, I have, I have a slight issue with the idea of writing Gebrauch's music. Um, I, I, I would like in in my own practice to be able to write music that that says a little bit more than 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 simply being useful. So I I try very hard to do something new, but at the same time I try to do something new within the context of a pretty strictly modal tonal language. Um, so for me, the focus is on tiny little details of, of say, dissonance resolution and things like that. Um, but on the other hand, um, sometimes I felt that just I can only speak for myself. And sometimes my best ideas have come when I've not been trying at all mm -hmm. and I've just let it happen. I don't know if you feel about that, but sometimes if you try to be original, try to force it, then you just get stuck. Yeah. Whereas if you just give up and write a piece sometimes mm -hmm. it's much better than you think it's going to be yeah i mean i i think i i think it if a piece is say quote unquote useful that doesn't necessarily mean that other attributes are not true about that piece i think a piece mm. a piece can be a useful piece and it can also be it can also have other you know that to me to me it's not a binary that precludes right it being mm -hmm you know, being a, also an artistic statement of it, of itself as well. Um, and, and yes, I think the way pieces emerge is as varied as any other, as a, any other thing and, and sort of, you know, composing is, there's so much in composing where you're sort of, I feel you're, you're balancing your, you're balancing your sort of critical faculties throughout the process and determining, you know, is this good enough? Is this new, you know, is this different enough than what I've done before? Where someone else, you say sort of those things where you're looking for originality or at least individuality, which I is a mm. word I sort of like more than originality and sort of freshness or, or whatever. You're sort of balancing those things from your mental perspective. But on the other hand, the other hand, if a little too much of that, particularly early in the process can crowd out, sort of choke out the creative impulse. Mm -hmm. And there's also a sense in which you need to you need to just keep working and sort of trust your instinct um, and keep going. Um, right. I, you know, I think this is this is I see this particularly with students who sometimes worry too early in the process, like they're they're not making enough progress. And part of 
sometimes it's because they're sort of being like, well, that's, that's not good enough, or I, I don't like that, or it's not, you know, and it's like, sometimes you have to push that aside a little bit and just keep going, just keep going, wait, wait to evaluate until you've, you've sort of worked a little more, um, because you, you have to have something to react against, you have to fundamentally have created something. Right, that's very interesting, because I mean, I find that in my creative process, um, the most enjoyable stage is is not so much the initial generation of ideas, but it's rather I write the piece and then I spend a much longer time going back over it and changing it and trying out different alternative routes of development, different avenues. And I find this this is where I really lose myself. Um, is it the same for you? I yeah, I think it depends on the it depends on the project. It depends on the project. Some some pieces come together very sort of easily in one sense, and then there are other pieces that take a lot longer in the in the process. It's either figuring out exactly what it wants to be or how it wants to develop. Um, you know, and the the subconscious mind can do all sorts of things mm -hmm. when working on a project. You know, even when you're even when you're sort of not actively thinking about it. Um, you know, and I certainly I've had cases where I've started something and it's not really clear to me at that moment what it goes from there. And then suddenly when I come back to it, it's totally clear, totally, you know, it's incredibly obvious what it needs to be to, to finish it up. So at some point, something, something was happening in the brain to, you know, to sort of overnight or a few days later, or whatever, get you to that, get you to that next point. Um, and then, yeah, and then sort of everyone has a different relationship to sort of what the editing and the tweaking and what sort of things, you know, uh, what sort of things one does with that. I think there's, you know, it varies, but, yeah. but um, yeah, I sort of learned to just try and go with the, go with the process for, you know, go with what seems to be f working in a particular way for a particular project. Um, and right. sometimes, sometimes things come very, very easily and, and sometimes, sometimes less so. It just, Not you know, so much. it depends. Yeah. I mean, this, been a lot of research done recently on the um, relationship between the um, conscious um, critical mind and the subconscious um, so I I'm, have you read a book called Thinking Fast Thinking Slow by Daniel Kahneman no I have not no okay that's very interesting because it, it taps into this how um, how people are able to operate at a higher level quickly using what I think he calls um, system one, mm. which is just what our implicit knowledge. And then there's system two, which is the rational part of the mind. And how this is in comparison, very, very slow. Sometimes we have to turn to it when, when the idea won't come. Mm. And the other thing which seems relevant is um, maybe, you know, Andrew Huberman, he's at Harvard, doesn't he? Um, or maybe I've, maybe I've got that wrong. Um, he's a neuroscientist. I don't know if your paths have ever crossed. I don't believe so. But he's no. put out some fascinating YouTube videos um, sharing his research, again, about how the um, subconscious mind is so very much quicker and how it's able to absorb information and make sense of it while mm -hmm. you're not consciously aware of it. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think... I, I agree it's best to sometimes just to step out of your own way and just to just to let it happen um so um this kind of brought me to the next thing quite naturally which is um you are very prolific um so your opus numbers go well over 1500 um and um I'm in awe of this because I mean I I've barely barely written 150 pieces in my whole life um, so I'd love to know, how do you generate so many ideas? And um, are there occasions when you do get writer's block? And if you do so, how do you get over it? Mm. The the generating of ideas part is has never been particularly difficult for me. Um, I, I honestly have more ideas than I will ever use in my entire lifetime. Um, and, Can I have some? And, and really have for a long time. That that has that just sort of has been the way it is it's now they're not all worth they're not all ideas worth doing something with of course right um for any number of reasons i but i i get 
I, I get all sorts of ideas all the time, and they're not just about music. They're about a lot of other things as well. I just don't do anything in those other fields. I don't have the technical skill to do them, but I get ideas for paintings and stories and all sorts of things. I don't, I don't do any of those things because I don't, I don't know how to make a painting or how to make a, you know, or how to write a novel or any of those things because those are not the fields that I've pursued, you know, pursued learning how to do. But in terms of the sort of general devising of ideas that is that is very easy and it's just sort of been the way it is um what what is more involved is sort of learning how to refine that learning how to do right. what you want to do in a particular piece or or to sort of focus focus things in a particular way so no i i i have never actually experienced what one would call a block per se that's i've never had that happen although that doesn't mean every moment of every day i'm writing music i'm definitely not sometimes i'll particularly in recent years, there's sometimes I'll go, I'll go several months without actually doing any actual, like, writing down music. I'll still be thinking about things, but I won't actually be writing anything out, um, just because of schedule or whatever. I could do it, but it's, it's not, you know, so I, I think there's, sometimes I think that's a misunderstanding, is that even if you have a lot of thoughts that you're not, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't just mean I'm just sitting there transcribing everything that I'm hearing in my head every day. Um, that would be really silly. And a lot of the things that I hear in my head, some of them are on, they're, they're sort of ideas, but they're not necessarily relevant to what I am doing. Right. Sometimes they're in other styles or, any, you know, you sort of imagine something in a different style or something else that's not really relevant to what I do as a composer. So it sort of just sort of goes through the mind and that's it. But um, okay. Have you ever been tempted to to try a completely different genre? Have you ever been tempted, for example, to write a pop song um, or even a hip hop song or anything like that? Not really. I, that other In the same way that I don't really, I, you know, in the same way that I don't know how to write a novel, say, I, right. I, I, I don't. And in some ways, I, I, you know, in some ways it. It, like I actually have more experience in some of those other genres because I, I read a lot of novels and I've, I've seen a lot of paintings. I actually have fairly little exposure to pop music in my life. It's never been a big, you know, I mean, obviously we all hear, hear plenty of it just living in the world, but it's never been a genre that's particularly interested me. So I've never actively sought it out. So my, my knowledge and sort of broad base of things in those kind of genres is is very minimal by comparison to my knowledge of classical music so that sort of would would make me not really pursue it you know i i i, I don't really know hip-hop so i i you know it, it wouldn't sort of cross my mind to know really where to begin and say and say doing it so so i haven't and i i don't particularly see that changing um but you know who knows never say never i guess but I don't, I don't think it's likely. And I think a lot of people, you know, a lot of people have very formative and very formative and important connections to pop music in their lives from, from a very young age through adulthood. And that's, I, you know, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that at all. That's just not my background or life at all. So I don't have those kind of resonances that are true for a lot of people, even people that are mostly classical musicians. A lot of them have strong, you know, strong, emotional or or situational history with pop music and that's that's great but that that's just not me yeah i mean when i was growing up um my parents liked the beatles very much indeed and i used to hear a lot of beatles songs um being played on our record player and such for the days <laughs> on vinyl and um i think the the lasting legacy of that for me is an appreciation simply of very good form the thing about the beatles best pieces is that um, they're just very beautifully structured. Everything is very clear cut, everything plays to the structure of the music, contributes in an efficient way. And then you have some very interesting surprises, but still subordinated to perform. Mm. And that, that has really struck with me. And, and one of my preoccupations creatively is indeed form. Now, I thought it might be very interesting to have a talk about the future direction of music to try to predict the future a little bit so in other words where is music going so um as i as i was saying when i was 
first and undergraduate at university, um, we were under a lot of pressure if we were studying composition to write in a highly dissonant, highly complex style. Um, and my inclination to write in a style that was influenced by the 16th and 17th century music that I, was, that I loved was, was pretty strongly discouraged, I would say. Um, however, in recent years, we've seen something of a resurgence in the influence and, um, and ubiquity of tonal music. So in the 1980s, you have Arvo Part and, um, and um, John Tavener making a very big splash. And then more recently, we've had Eric Whittaker, Ola Yelo and Morton Lauridsen. Was it Lauridsen? I don't know how to Lauridsen. pronounce that. Lauridsen. Okay. Yeah. And... Um, and yet, at the same time, there are still some people who are uncompromisingly modernist in their approach. People such as Thomas Adairs and um, is it Helmut Lahnemann Lahn and James yeah. Macmillan. And so there's, there's still strong strands um, of that continuing. And we've also had the emergence of video game music and film music being taken much more seriously and coming into the concert hall. And also in, in my own university department at Newcastle, um, many of my colleagues are giving very serious consideration to such topics as hip hop, electric acoustic music, folk music, and, and many other traditions, um, almost to the point where I feel um, something of an outlier um, with, my, with my own little modal compositions. Um, so, um, what what are your thoughts on all of those things? Sorry, it's quite a lot actually, <laughs> but take it away. <laughs> yeah, well, I think there there is a broad range of what people are doing now. I think that's an exciting part of the present time. Um, even just within, say, new quote unquote classical music, if if even if even if restricting it to that, the variety of expressive ends that people are putting music to is very is quite varied. And we're we're obviously in a time now where they're for much of the 20th century and now beyond, there is there is no common practice on, on, on style. And I think that has created a lot of exciting possibilities for people and a, a lot of chances for people to go in the direction that they feel best represents what they, um, what they want to do. It, certainly at certain places or contexts or certain teachers or environments, there, there, there is probably still pressure to do things one way or another in a certain sense. But in the broader sense of possibilities, there's a, I think there's probably a place for everyone in some ways. Um, and of course, even, even during times when a lot of music written in academic contexts was um, of a fairly, fairly adventurous cast, you know, tonal music, tonal and consonant music was still being written all along by plenty of people. Mm. You know, it never, it's not like it ever disappeared per se. Um, and I, I think, I think now there's a wider, there's just, there's, a, there's more room for possibilities for, for a few, for the particular direction that you want to go. And for composers whose work um, encompasses a variety of things. I, I, you mentioned Macmillan, who I certainly see in that category. His, his music has everything on the table. It can be blazingly dissonant or luminously consonant or and everything in between, sometimes within the same piece. And I think I, I think he often uses it to tremendous ends. Um, and it's sort of like it couldn't be what it was if it didn't have the entire weight of history there behind it. Everything. It wouldn't be the way it is without high modernism. It wouldn't be the way it is without very old tonal music and modal music as well. Um, sort of all going into the mix. So. I, you know, I, it's hard to predict the future, but I, I hope there will continue to be place for people doing different sorts of things, depending on what their goals are. I, I, I like variety. It's just a it, it, variety interests me. Um, and so I'm all in favor of any environment or circumstance that that allows that to flourish in in one way or another. Brilliant. So harmony of diversity by the sound of it. Yeah, yeah, I, I think there's, I think there's, you know, there's, there's a way to do good work in nearly any direction, I think, um, and, and having those possibilities open for people is, I think, valuable.
How do you feel about generative AI? Do you consider it to be a threat or um, is it perhaps something that we can welcome as a new creative tool even? Yeah, I, I, I think people, I don't know, I think it, it remains in sort of classical music, it remains to be seen what its impact will be. Um, uh, we're in such a sub, uh, we're in such a non-commercial subset. The, you know, classical music in general is arguably a non-commercial enterprise and then contemporary classical music, a subset of a subset. You know, and and the development of a lot of these tools is very much predicated on a business business models and and a commercial scale. So, you know, a lot of the generative AI that's music focused at this point is more towards towards music in pop or or right. video games ambient film. You know, so be, because those are those are fields where there is commercial enterprise still very much on the table. Um, what will it be like when when and if the technology continues to develop in ways that explores you know there has been research not even recently there was there's been david cope from from american composer and researcher was doing things with classical music and and analytical and generative ai back in the the 70s up to the present with sort of yes yeah, so i actually read some of his work um i was um, browsing through our university library um, a couple of years ago and I found his book and it was surprising to me how far the technology had come even even towards the end of the 70s so yeah that was very interesting but speaking for myself um I'm not actually that worried about generative AI because it seems to me that AI is good at repairing gaps so if you have a certain amount of information so it could be useful from a scholarly point of view say to reconstruct early music and it's very good at making a pastiche so it can analyze a composer's work and come up with something that sounds like that composer's work but the thing that ai i think can never have is for human will so the thing about a great piece of music is one always has the impression that it's the other composer the, the composer speaking directly to you expressing something of his or her will to you and a computer by definition simply can't have that will mm -hmm. um but maybe they they will come to the point where it's able to simulate it in a convincing right. way right i think that's probably that's probably the point it may get to eventually and, and that may be decades away or who you know who knows it may get to a point where what it's generating is not distinguishable from from something made in another you know but i it's hard i i i tend not to worry too much about it partially because there's nothing i can do about it one way or another you know um but also because i i sort of feel at least at least for the present and for some degree of the foreseeable future i think there will still be a space for genuine genuine human creative inquiry um and you know i there are, I'm sure, people who will find interesting ways to use this, use technology as a tool in their own work in the same way that some people in the fields of art and writing and things have found ways of using it in their own work. Not, not in the sense of like, I just, I know nothing and I type something in and then it spits something out and then I'm done with it. You know, people can do that with the image and text tools that exist. That, that doesn't, that doesn't seem that interesting to me. What's more interesting are you know, artists who are working in like AI assisted photo art or things where they are themselves in collaboration with the technology, you know, producing work that is still their artistic vision. They're just using it as a as a tool in the process. And so I'm sure right. I'm sure there will continue and be increasing ways that people find ways of doing that musically too in different things. And that that could be interesting or not, depending on who's doing just like any piece of music. Some people write interesting music, some people don't. So, you know, I mean, I think in that sense, it's just as it's just as possible as anything else. Um, and and yeah. some people will find that an interesting area to pursue. Other people will have no interest in that. Um, um, OK, so well, so it's relevant, I guess, um, to mention the fields of chess and mm -hmm. um, things like that, because um, I mean, even in the 1990s, um, chess computers became way stronger than humans. And um, now they are exponentially 
better at playing the game of chess. But the thing is that um, I have absolutely no interest. To, I mean, I, I quite enjoy watching chess. I don't play the game anymore, um, but I like watching the game being played by top players. But this is the point. I like watching the human top players because I find watching Alpha Zero or Leela or whatever it's called, watching them play, it doesn't speak to me in any way. Whereas with, with watching human players, so I followed the World Championship between the Pomniachi and um, Dingli Ren very closely last year. And the games were full of mistakes, but that was part of the excitement is watching humans playing under a massive amount of pressure, making mistakes, repairing those mistakes, facing up to the consequences of those mistakes. And I think in a sense with human composed music is, is that humans do things that are unpredictable. I mean, won't say make mistakes, but um, humans would simply take music in directions that a computer cannot because it, it doesn't have that ability to, to be human. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I think to the extent that that is still a thing we can see and value in the work that's going to be. That's, and I think, I think a lot of the tasks that computers have been and are good at are, are tasks that fall a little more into the sort of puzzle solving category. And that's why you sort of can teach a computer to play chess. And I think, you know, you could teach it the, the Fuchs exercises or that, you know, you could sort of teach it the rules and it could come up with, you know, two voices of music, I'm sure that that obey every rule, nothing moves the way it's not supposed to. Is that good music? Probably not, it, you know. Well, no. It, it's I mean, just, you know, it, like odds are it's not. And it's sort of like that. But on the other hand, like I'm not that interested in someone's, classroom work on those exercises either you know I, that doesn't interest me what interests me is someone who's taken and internalized all that knowledge and is now writing their own work that maybe is very informed by that but it's their own you know exercises are exercises to me that that doesn't that doesn't interest me as sort of art and i think a lot of the a lot of what the computer can do at the current stage is more in the sort of exercise category it can sometimes it can where it starts to impress is it does it so quickly and at such a big level mm -hmm. so that when it like creates a photo from seemingly nothing or like it's not actually from nothing of course it's highly general you know it's highly it's a database but like it impresses us because that happened in like three or four seconds and is mm -hmm. huge and you know so I think we're sort of wowed by that aspect of it even though the technology part is very sort of still much in the kind of problem solving exercise stage of things and I think for a lot of us within the sense of creativity, we sort of, we at least hope that what we're doing is add something ineffable that's beyond that, the sort of that human element. Are we just deluding ourselves so that the computers don't take us over and we still claim to be special? I, I don't know, but, but we sort of, we sort of have to work with what we have. So we have human brains, not computer brains. So. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I feel feel mildly embarrassed for having um, answered a rhetorical question a, a few moments ago. But I'm um, going back to um, going back to the Fuchs exercises. Um, I use those when teaching composition, mm -hmm. and the thing that I reiterate to students is that, um, well, actually, you know, it's not difficult to write a species counterpoint exercise at all. If you had been a chorister in the 16th century, you would have been expected to be able to make this stuff up on the spot. The real difficulty is being able to put some artistry into it, to be able to say something um, mm -hmm. there. So yeah, I can I can well imagine that um, computers would find writing correct counterpoint to, to be a very, very easy thing, but um, to say something with that counterpoint would be an altogether different challenge. Now, um, I'd like to just go back, go back to your work and um, ask you um, just to tell me a little bit about some of your landmark compositions. What pieces in your career are you particularly fond of, which stand mm. out as milestones for you? It's a little tough because I have a lot of pieces. It's a, it's, it's, it's a little bit tough of a question. Not not because I can't remember them. I still can remember them. I may get to the point where I've started to forget them, but I'm not there yet. So we'll see. Even people that have written far fewer pieces, I know I've known friends later in life who who have started to forget earlier pieces. So I'm perfectly willing to accept that that will be a natural thing that will come at some point. Um, but I, you know, I 
Um, the the three oratorios I've written, I guess I consider to be significant pieces. They're also on the larger scale. So that, not that I believe size is the thing that makes the difference, you know, as to whether a piece is important or not. I think that's a very dangerous notion. But um, but those those came at important points in my life and development. Um, and so those, the, and they're, they're, they're sort of three very different approaches to the notion of what what an oratorio can be. Um, uh, the five orchestral symphonies I've written, I suppose, are are significant um, in the sense that we put a lot of weight on a piece that's given that title. <laughs> um, and and there are certain, you know, there are certain works in other genres. There are certain, certain organ works and certain choral motets or chamber pieces that I have a sort of fondness for. It's it's hard to single, it's hard to single out just a just you know one piece or two pieces mostly because the expressive dimensions i think are varied and i sort of you know i don't expect everyone to like everything in the same way or have the same reaction i think some people some people are not that interested in the music that's more consonant and some people are not that interested in the music that's you know sort of a little more a little less so um so i i don't know it's a tough it's a tough question it's a tough question um um and I, I, in the same way that I like a wide dimension in other things, I like, you know, I have pieces that are several seconds long and I have pieces that are well over an hour long, you know, and to me, those, those do very, they do very different things. Most pieces are somewhere in between those extremes, obviously, but. Yeah, can I just take you back a little bit there? Because, um, I mean, yes, I mean, writing large scale compositions, um, I've not written many large scale pieces. I've written a, a kind of choral symphony, which was a commission for, a, for Cumbria Royal Choirs a few years ago. And I've still yet to hear it performed in its orchestral state because um, the week before its, before its premiere, and the country went into lockdown because of COVID. Mm -hmm. So that that was a bit of a disappointment. I've since heard it performed with a piano mm -hmm. taking the place of the orchestra, which was, you know, one day I'd like to hear it done properly. And I've also composed my own symphony. And the, the thing I really enjoyed was being able to really go deep into ideas and to produce large scale forms where ideas arch over a, a long span of time. But another thing which fascinates me is, is writing on a tiny, tiny scale, because that's really hard. Um, oh, very hard. Many, many people think, oh, you know, to write a, a short piece would, you know, you could just knock something up as, yeah. as a horrible expression that has been used. Um, but but I, I, I can't do that. I find that the hardest pieces to write in many respects are really short ones because you've got to come up with an idea um, that you can develop to its full extent within a short time, but not an idea that requires a, long, a larger ca canvas in mm -hmm. order to make most potential. So that's, that's a real challenge. But um, you say you've written some pieces that are only a few seconds long. So I'm really interested to hear a bit more about those, it please. Yeah, it's a, it's a, I, I think there's a wide, yeah, there's a wide variety of possibilities depending on the length and depending on the material. And I think, I think it can be an amazing challenge. The English composer Howard Skempton is, is a composer that's been very important to me since really, since I discovered his work at a pretty young age. And he is an absolute master at producing something that's just so focused. The idea gets exactly the amount of development or or elaboration that it needs and no further. And sometimes that means it's, you know, a few seconds long. Sometimes that means some he has written some longer pieces as well. But that sense of of chiseling that I sort of that idea to its most striking and strong place, and then sort of letting it happen in exactly the way it's supposed to happen and then stop. And I think formally some of the formally some of the, the pieces that are very short are very non-traditional that way. They're not, you know, they're they don't because they don't develop in a typical structure. They're there's they're almost more akin to um sculpture or visual art or something in that it's an, an sort of a sound object that's here or that something that's happened on the Sol scale. So I think the the smaller pieces that I've written um sort of live more in that in that world um that doesn't mean that they sometimes they use very consonant materials or things it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that that's not true but at last year i wrote up uh, uh the um 
English organist Matthew Owens commissioned a, a full-length concert piece. It's about 75 minutes long. Um, and it's a it's a set at his request. It's a it's a set of twenty five preludes and fugues, but they are firstly they're it's not a collection of preludes and fugues. It's a single piece. It's a single seventy five minute piece. It's just right. organized as a set of preludes and fugues. And across those preludes and fugues, every parameter changes. So there are some fugues that are only a few seconds long, and then there are fugues that are a few minutes long. And the prelude sort of the, the lengths of everything keep changing in relation and, and they, they each one is sort of exploring its notion in the widest realm of possibility the only thing that links it together is that all the preludes are sort of concerned with melody and harmony and the fugues are uh contrapuntal and in a consistent number of voices but that's that's it that's the only that's the only uh thing that that though they had necessarily have in common and the, the subject of each fugue is derived from each prelude although it's very often not the theme you think it will be it might be like a little bit of an accompaniment or something from the prelude that suddenly unexpectedly becomes the fugue subject um and so the the idea the idea was to to sort of see all those different possible directions for working with that kind of material and that scale and even though there's this seemingly very traditional structure imposed on it my goal was to make a really multifaceted and hopefully varied concert piece um within this thing but you know to uh to uh my my notion of what the fugue has been and the pieces that I've called fugue has always been very very non-traditional because I've always been just there's way way too many pieces by contemporary composers that are sort of ostensibly praises and fugues and there's often a very interesting and creative prelude and then the fugue starts and it's the it is like you're back in school again you know it's it becomes this sort of dry exercise because that's how they like still think about and imagine the possibilities of writing kind mm -hmm. of work. and it's this sort of you know to me the dullness of the fugue is it can be you know there's so many people that seem to approach it this way and so I always subversively in the pieces I've written with Fugue have always gone the other direction. They 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 break every possible element of convention in one way or another, um, or react against them in different ways. They're just contrapuntal and imitative, and some of them have the typical, you know, one of them is a fugue that in one of the sets of phrases and fugues, the, the fugue has all the like typical waypoints of a traditional fugue, but it's only about 16 bars long. But it has it has all the different things. It moves to the keys, has episodes, stretto, and everything. It just it's just mm -hmm. ridiculously compressed. And then to not be at the end, at the very end, the coda of it is the entrance of an extra voice that then just enters on its own. Oh, and then, how exciting! And then just yeah. stops just on its own. So it's it's very subversive. So my approach to the fugue has always been that. So this this large piece for Matthew sort of in a sense takes that takes that to a different a different level. I, I'm sorry, now I don't know why I got onto all that. I guess we were talking about the ways of approaching a, the, a very very short piece. Um, but yeah. it's yeah, to me it's a it's about it's about just the, they take a concentration and a focus on the, the material that's very. And I, I and I do find often they become fairly non-traditional because tradition most traditional structures tend to have a want a certain amount of time that they want to unfold in. As, mm. as a, you know, if you're going to write a little rondo or something, it wants it, it's going to need a certain amount of time to be that. And so I find the very short pieces formally are sort of often very much their own thing. They're not they're not sort of genre pieces in any way. Now, one of the many things that I admire about you is, um, in addition to being so active as a composer and as an organist, you you also champion a large number of other composers' music, which is very generous of you. And um, I've benefited from this. Um, so you've performed and recorded a number of my pieces. And um, it's great also to hear you performing pieces by um, many others on your YouTube channel. Um, so just, would you mind telling me a, a little bit more about this, um, side of, side of your activity? My, my life as a performer, um, and as primarily an organist, um, at least professionally, um, 
primarily an organist. Um, but since the early, my sort of earliest years of pursuing a performing life in a serious way has always focused on contemporary music exclusively. Um, that was, that became clear by the time I was getting to the end before college, when I was still in school, it was by the time I was sort of be very, you know, in those, it was becoming clear that that was going to be my focus, my interest in performing contemporary music. Um, it's what interests me. I like working with composers. I like the variety that's poss possible. Um, I like mm. the fact that you can do a program of all contemporary music, as I do have done hundreds of times over the years in all different places, and that that program can be incredibly varied uh, because, you know, I will include everything from very, very traditionally made new pieces to sometimes extremely wild things. And that entire continuum and everything on it is available. Um, and there's actually far more variety in a program of old contemporary music than there is in a program of old Baroque music, say. Mm, indeed. Uh, so, so I, that's why it's been my focus. Um, that's not to say I don't enjoy some of the traditional literature and repertoire. I do, but literally everybody else plays it to death. So it does not yeah. need me. It does not need me to play any of it. Um, and so, so the activities I've done recording have, have just been an outgrowth of that. It's been an outgrowth of engaging with new music for the organ and, and sometimes the piano. Uh, during the lockdown, I, I, when I wasn't touring at all, I, I, I got back to the piano a little bit more. I hadn't, I've, you know, I've always played the piano as well, even though the organ's been my primary instrument. But I, during the lockdown time when there wasn't so much to do, I, I started recording some piano pieces that I'd always liked as well, just because there was time for it but the organ is the primary focus but my my recording activities are are just an outgrowth of what my interests are as a concert performer as well i just I, i'm able to do a lot more i'm able to record a lot of pieces that i can't perform in concert just for the sake of time or you know there's only so many concerts one plays um and i can you know so so i think at this point i think i've recorded just over seven thousand organ pieces by wow contemporary composers um, sort of from the mid 20th century on to the present, most, most of whom are still living or were living when I recorded them. Some, sometimes, <laughs> some, sometimes some older things, but, but not, not certainly nothing pre 1940. I think that might be the earliest of anything I've ever recorded. Um, and most things very, very recent, mo you know, a great deal of it within the last, the last, you know, last few years, because people are always sending me things. Um, and I don't, I, I, I sort of have developed a way I sort of, I engage with everything I'm sent. And if it's something I like, I, I will record it. If it's something I like, but is very, very difficult, it goes into a separate pile to get to later. And sometimes that takes years. Again, during the lockdown, I made big headway in that really difficult pile because there was nowhere to go. <laughs> so I was able to spend time practicing it. Things that are easier, I can get to much more quickly. Um, and I, and another, another a facet that I, I like to continue to showcase pieces that are not exceptionally difficult to play because I think they have the potential for other people to find them and think that they could play them as well. Um, you know, which which is a which is another important part of it for me. I want to I want to sort of show this music and what's possible for people. Um, so so it's a sort of my activities and it's sort of building a kind of library of of you know, demonstration recordings of of pieces that have interested me. Oh, well, yeah. And of course, it's possible to write music that is not too difficult, but at the same time, which which nevertheless is fascinating and which mm -hmm. um, which offers something original and interesting to say, like your Ricciacare that you, you wrote for me. So that's well within my limited abilities as an organist mm -hmm. but it also gave me something interesting to do that's not, well i don't feel written down to i feel i i feel lifted up by this music i was i was very very happy to receive that so thank you again and one thing is you're saying about the about a concert of baroque music would not have a great deal of um, variety and I thought there's a certain delicious irony there because um, reading theorists of the um, 17th and 18th century, the number one word that they used to describe their aesthetic goals is 
variety <laughs> and yet here we are right right well what, no to, just, just to be clear what I, I didn't say that it didn't have variety right what i said was that a concert of all new music can have greater variety than is possible yeah the, of course um, one of my best friends from college is a baroque musician he runs a baroque ensemble and i i have attended and listened to his concerts which i which i enjoy and you know within within the confines within the historical confines there can be great variety but it is it, it's it's sort of every shade within this box and and yeah. wonderful in its own way the 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 possibilities on a new music concert are this wide from arms on the keyboard to the simplest neo-modal richard Carr, on the other hand you know those are all possible even new pieces truly in historical styles which some people pursue as well some of that interests me not as much because I it's a sort of question of when is it exercise versus when is it, you know, new work. But there are some people that take that very seriously, basically writing in in a sort of Baroque style today. Um, you know, so so like that is that is technically new music that's being written now, along with the most avant-garde things coming out of a German festival. Oh no, yeah. I mean it it certainly makes me wonder as a kind of thought experiment. I mean, if a composer were able to repeat that was indistinguishable from Bach, then um, why why not perform that music? Because isn't it just the same as, you know, stumbling across an authentic mm -hmm. composition of yeah. his in a cupboard somewhere? Yeah, I, I don't think there's any, I mean, there's certainly nothing like morally wrong with the choice to do that. I In general, people who are doing that, their work has tended to interest me less because a lot of mm. it is more about stylistic problem solving in a puzzle way. But mm. it doesn't, but it, it depends. It depends on who's doing it. There are people that work in that, some people that work in that highly, highly traditional world whose work I have found interesting because I feel that they are bringing some aspect of their own personality to it. They they may be deeply inspired by Bach or by Haydn or whomever they're like in the wings, but they're not trying to like write a piece that they would pass off as by Bach or an exercise. Right. They're they're writing, you know, and even if like its world is stylistically still entirely there, it's not like it also has contemporary elements that couldn't exist then. It's not like it's not fooling anyone that it's by Bach because it has some of their own personality in it too. And that that I think can be that I think can absolutely can be interesting. It's like anything else. It just sort of depends on the piece or who's writing it or, you know, some music is interesting, some music isn't. So Okay. Well, we've talked a great deal about music. So um sort of to tie things up a bit, um, I just wondered um if I might ask you about your hobbies and other other interests and activities. I mean, you've already mentioned um that you enjoy viewing paintings and um reading I do, novels. I, yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, I, I re I do read a lot. That's probably the main thing I do outside of outside of music. I, I enjoy visual art very much. I have no skill or training or particular ability to create it um but um in another lifetime i would have enjoyed being an art critic very much um I, I i like thinking about it analytically and i would have enjoyed the possibilities of studying and writing about it in a you know in a parallel universe where you make different decisions um but i well, I, I, I don't have any ability as a painter but but, uh, and, I, but uh, i enjoy it a lot so who, who are your favorite writers I am uh, like in other things. I I will read just about anything. I, okay. I I will read just about anything from from fairly lowbrow to exceptionally highbrow, and I I try and keep it completely in the mix. For that, again, it's it's one of those things where how when I when I'm composing, I don't want the next piece I write to be in the same genre as the piece I wrote before. I I have a similar approach to reading. So if I finished a sort of silly detective novel then i go to something extremely complicated and multi-layered as the next book i read so um so the yeah so I, 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 i've way. always i've always been a fairly fast reader so i i get through a lot of material and that also means i don't have to i don't have to worry too much about a particular thing for for some people whose reading pace is a little slower you you the commitment is bigger because it's like I'm going to commit to this book and I know I want it to be really good and I know it has to be exactly the thing I'm interested in because I'm going to spend, you know, the next few months reading it. So I totally get that sort of thing. I, you know, I can read a book in a day or a couple days or something. So then it's, then it's, it's less of a commitment. If it's not the greatest thing I've ever read. That's okay because it's over and there'll be another one. So I guess you're going 
to say again about variety, but um, going into things, um, do you have any favourite artists, sculptors, any anyone that you particularly like to view? So I think we might have been kiboshed a little by the internet here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I again, I I I, I tend not to single people out specifically. Um, I, I there's so many there's so many people doing interesting work. I, every time I go to a museum or gallery, I can find some at least something. Sometimes many somethings that that just completely change my perspective on something or make me really excited. So um, it's another time, you know, it's another similar to the variety that's possible in music today. That's also happening in the visual art world as well. And that, that is, it's, I don't know. I, I find it very exciting. I find it very exciting to, to think that those possibilities are that wide. It means I just sort of, I sort of never get tired of anything because there's always, there's always so much difference that's possible. Mm, that's, a, that's a wonderful approach to take through to take through life, being able to enjoy such a diversity of interests and and to find constant refreshment and engagement. Um, right. So really, just to bring things to a close, one last thing I'd like to ask you about, which is that I've noticed in in many of your publications, you have a cute teddy bear logo. And I wondered if you'd kindly tell oh, me a little bit more yeah, about, yeah. about that. Um, you know, my brother made that that logo for me. It's it's my I have a I have a relatively sizable collection of teddy bears. Um and my brother my brother made that logo for me. It's it's just the the bear's face is is are my initials. There's the uh -huh. C on one side and then the reverse C on the other side is the part of the bear's face. And then the bear's sort of nose and mouth area is P, which is my middle initial. So, right. so that's, that's why he sort of came up with that as a logo. And the face, the, there's a little sort of blemish on one side and a, and a little misshapen ear. And those are those are based on the bear that I have had since I was, that was given to me when I was born and still have. So my knowing that my 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 brother drew that for me when I was when I was making a a, a sort of logo to put on things. Yeah. Well, I love I love whimsical touches like that. <laughs> I mean, as you'll see, I have Claudio Montiberdi yes. as um, yes. Yes. <laughs> as my own um, as my own sort of uh, trademark. Um, so it's my cunning plan to um, essentially to associate my name with blackbirds. <laughs> So they're everywhere and they have such gorgeous um, singing voices so definitely definitely but, but just you know i, th I think just a, a cute visual absolutely uh, absolutely detail is is always worth having <laughs> yeah. right well it's been it's been an absolute joy um to be able to talk to you and to explore Likewise. so many interesting areas um so um thank you ever so much and um hope to have the opportunity to speak to you again on another occasion before too long. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.